The One Straw Revolution by Masanobu Fukuoka. This is his signing of my book, my copy. Let the fruits of nature fall into your mouth while lying under a tree doing nothing, rather than run about like a fool thinking you will achieve something. This leads to the ideogram, ideogram of Mu, which is nothingness, and thus the bounty, the bounty of Mother Nature. This is chapter 5, returning to the source. Leaning against the long handle of my scythe, I pause in my work in the orchard and gaze out at the mountains and the village below. I wonder how it is that people's philosophies have come to spin faster than the changing seasons. The path I have followed, this natural way of farming, which strikes most people as strange, was first interpreted as a reaction against the advance and reckless development of science. But all I have been doing, farming out here in the country, is trying to show that humanity knows nothing. Because the world is moving with such furious energy in the opposite direction, it may appear that I have fallen behind the times. But I firmly believe that the path I have been following is the most sensible one. During the past few years, the number of people interested in natural farming has grown considerably. It seems that the limit of scientific development has been reached. Misgivings have begun to be felt. And the time for reprisal has arrived. That which was viewed as primitive and backward is now unexpectedly seen to be far ahead of modern science. This may seem strange at first, but I do not find it strange at all. I discussed this with Kyoto University professor Inuma recently. A thousand years ago, agriculture was practiced in Japan without plowing, and it was not until the Tokugawa era, 300 to 400 years ago that shallow cultivation was introduced. Deep plowing came to Japan with Western agriculture. I said that in coping with the problems of the future, the next generation would return to the non-cultivation method. To grow crops in an unplowed field may seem at first a regression to primitive agriculture, but over the years this method has been shown in university laboratories and agricultural testing centers across the country to be the most simple, efficient, and up-to-date method of all. Although this way of farming disavows modern science, it now has come to stand in the forefront of modern agricultural development. I presented this direct seeding, non-cultivation, winter grain slash rice, rice succession in agricultural journals 20 years ago. From then on it appeared often in print and was introduced to the public at large on radio and television programs many times, but nobody paid much attention to it. Now suddenly it is a completely different story. You might say that natural farming has become the rage. Journalists, professors and technical researchers are flocking to visit my fields and the huts up on the mountain. Different people see it from different points of view, make their own interpretations and let then leave. One sees it as primitive, another as backward. Someone else considers it the pinnacle of agricultural achievement and a fourth hails it as a breakthrough into the future. In general, people are only concerned with whether this kind of farming is an advance into the future or a revival of times past. Few are able to grasp correctly that natural farming arises from the unmoving and unchanging center of agricultural development. To the extent that people separate themselves from nature, they spin out further and further from the center. At the same time, a centripetal effect asserts itself and the desire to return to nature arises. But if people merely become caught up in reacting, moving to the left 
and the right, depending on conditions, the result is only more activity. The non-moving point of origin, which lies outside the realm of relativity, is passed over unnoticed. I believe that even returning to nature and anti-pollution activities, no matter how commendable, are not moving towards a, genu a genuine solution if they are carried out solely in reaction to the overdevelopment of the present age. Nature does not change. Although the way of viewing nature invariably changes from age to age, no matter the age, natural farming exists forever as the wellspring of agriculture. Chapter 6 One reason that natural farming has not spread. Over the past 20 or 30 years, this method of growing rice and winter grain has been tested over a wide range of climates and natural conditions. Almost every prefecture in Japan has run tests comparing yields of direct seeding non-cultivation with those of paddy rice growing and the usual ridge and furrow rye and barley cultivation. These tests have produced no evidence to contradict the universal applicability of natural farming and so one may ask why this truth has not spread. I think that one of the reasons is that the world has become so specialized that it has become impossible for people to grasp anything in its entirety. For example, an expert in insect damage prevention from the Kochi Prefectural Testing Center came to inquire why there were so few rice leaf hoppers in my fields, even though I had not used in any insecticide. Upon investigating the habitat, the balance between insects and their natural enemies, the rate of spider propagation and so on, the leaf hoppers were found to be just as scarce in my fields as in the center's fields, which are sprayed countless times with a variety of deadly chemicals. The professor was also surprised to find that while the harmful insects were few, their natural predators were far, far more numerous in my fields than in the sprayed fields. Then it dawned on him that the fields were being maintained in this state by means of a natural balance established among the various insect communities. He acknowledged that if my method were generally adopted, the problem of crop devastation by leafhoppers could be solved. He then got into his car and returned to Kochi. But if you ask whether or not the testing center's soil fertility or crop specialists have come here, the answer is no, they have not. And if you were to suggest at a conference or gathering that this method, or rather non-method, be tried on a wide scale, it is my guess that the prefecture or research station would reply, sorry, it's too early for that. We must first carry out research from every possible angle before giving final approval. It would take years for a conclusion to come down. This sort of thing goes on all the time. Specialists and technicians from all over Japan have come to this farm, seeing the fields from the standpoint of their own speciality. Every one of these researchers have, has found them at least satisfactory, if not remarkable. But in the five or six years since the professor from the research station came to visit here, there have been few changes in Kochi Prefecture. This year, the Agriculture Department of Kinki University has set up a natural farming project team in which students of several different departments will come here to, to, to conduct investigations. This approach may be one step nearer, but I have a feeling that the next move may be two steps in the opposite direction. Self-styled experts often comment, the basic idea or the method is all right, but wouldn't it be more convenient to harvest by machine? Or wouldn't the yield be greater if you use fertilizer or pesticide in certain cases or at certain times? There are always those who try to mix natural 
and scientific farming. But this way of thinking completely misses the point. The farmer who moves towards compromise can no longer criticize science at the fundamental level. Natural farming is gentle and easy and indicates a return to the source of farming. A single step away from the source can only lead one astray. More to come.